Senate has now passed the indefinite detention bill, 86 to 13. That after the House uh, passed the defense bill, this is the reconciled version, uh, the one that the president is now expected to sign. Russia Today writes exactly 220 years to the date after the Bill of Rights was ratified. The U.S. Senate today voted 86 to 13 in favor of the NDAA for fiscal year 2012, allowing the indefinite detention and torture of Americans. And we are, of course, waiting to see if Obama will sign it as expected, perhaps in the middle of the night. Uh, like everything else outside of law. Now, VOA News reports on the House passing the defense bill 283 to 136, adding that the White House had previously warned of a veto for any bill that challenges or constrains the president's authority to collect intelligence, incapacitate terrorists, and protect the nation. The Obama administration argues that the military, law enforcement officials, and intelligence agents need flexibility to act on a case-by-case -case basis. Now... Paul Joseph Watson gets into the whole deception around Obama's previous threat to veto this NDAA bill, which he never had any real intention of doing. He, of course, is for the power to indefinitely detain Americans. He just doesn't want the military to supersede his executive branch power to make that determination. Headline, Obama's U-turn on indefinite detention bill, a historic tragedy for rights. Indeed, it is. The Human Rights Watch has labeled President Obama's U-turn a historic tragedy for rights, adding, by signing this defense bill, President Obama will go down in history as the president who enshrined indefinite detention without trial in U.S. law, said Kenneth Roth, executive director of Human Rights Watch. In the past, Obama has allotted the importance of being on the right side of history today. Today he's clearly on the wrong side. And then Paul Joseph Watson adds, while this is a nice tone from the Human Rights Watch and the ACLU, Obama's veto threat was never about stopping detention without trial of American citizens. It was about ensuring that the federal government didn't completely hand such powers over to the U.S. military and enshrining into law Obama's unconstitutional policy of targeting Americans as terrorists without the legal requirement to offer any proof. How disgusting is this? Now, if this whole controversy over the NDAA bill has been confusing to you, Washington's blog has made it about as simple as possible. They have vowed to explain to a five-year-old why the indefinite detention bill does apply to U.S. citizens on U.S. soil. The bill says that the military must indefinitely detain anyone suspected of helping the bad guys. The article breaks down. One provision says that the mandatory, that is the word must, indefinite detention doesn't apply to U.S. citizens, but the government can indefinitely detain any citizen it feels like without trial. In other words, it's like saying you don't have to lock up Joey for the rest of his life because he called you a mean name, but you can lock him away and throw away the key then falsely accuse of him being a suspected terrorist if it would make you happy. And that is, in essence, what is in this bill. The determination is whether it's mandatory to indefinitely detain a U.S. American citizen suspected of being involved in al-Qaeda or terrorism, or whether it's at the president's discretion. Either way, it's total tyranny, totally in violation of the Bill of Rights. Of course, there's a lot of other stuff stuffed into this terrible National Defense Authorization Bill, including Kurt Nemo's NDAA gives the Pentagon green light to wage internet war. The following language is in the final reconciled bill that will now travel to the Senate and ultimately to Obama's desk where it will be signed into law. Now it has passed the Senate, despite earlier assertions that he would veto the legislation. Congress affirms that the Department of Defense has the capability and upon direction by the president may conduct offensive operations in cyberspace to defend our nation, allies and interests subject to the policy principles and legal regimes that the department follows for kinetic capabilities, including the law of armed conflict and the war powers resolution. It's a bunch of mumbo jumbo people, all this kinetic action talk. They have instituted total tyranny and now they're going to go after you on the internet as well. Now, of course, as you see behind me, with Obama prepared to sign, Pennsylvania senators get Twitter bombed over defense bill. Of course, everybody is angry about this bill, rightfully so. 
Uh, they should be most uh, unhappy that Obama is going to sign it after threatening to veto it. Of course, it was never over the indefinite detention. It was over his power as president because all these presidents have put in a, um, an overreach of executive power through their through their executive orders, their signing statements, and the rest of it. George W. Bush did it. This is just an extension of that. And with that in mind, I just wanted to point out this movie that we have for sale at Infowars.com. It is Outside the Law, Stories from Guantanamo. I just happened to have watched it last night. It's very relevant, though, given that they have now passed a law claiming the authority to detain indefinitely American citizens. This, of course, gets into a lot of presumably innocent people who are caught up in Guantanamo and all the other secret prisons they don't want to talk about that are overseas and how those people were in uh, how those people were detained indefinitely not given access to lawyers not even shown their charges all the alleged evidence uh, was all under classified seal and it was all just a big kangaroo circus court of course there's real people who got caught up in it they weren't even members of al-qaeda in most cases largely because people were selling them out. And now this is the kind of abuse of power everyone was so upset about under the George W. Bush administration. Now it's going to happen even to Americans under Obama. Don't you see how the executive tyranny goes on and on with the aid of Congress, of course. And that is why we wanted to bring up in full the Bill of Rights. Now, what is the Bill of Rights? It wasn't originally part of the Constitution, passed in 1789. In fact, it only came about after many states threatened to not ratify the Constitution because of lack of adequate protection from government overreach. Now, a bunch of anti-federalists, one of the factions at the time, were against the centralized power plans of the federalists that included Alexander Hamilton, who was also for the first centralized bank in the country, and people like John Adams and so forth. Uh, a bunch of anti-federalists, including Patrick Henry, chief among them, give me liberty or give me death, fought for the Bill of Rights, and eventually they were added uh, minus two at the front that had to do with apportionment of Congress and so forth. Those were dropped, but the core ten were added, and we're going to read them now in full. But I want to first point out the preamble to the Bill of Rights, which explains uh, in one paragraph why they passed it. Of course, this is old language. I know many people went to public school if they got an education at all, so I'll try to break it down for you as well. The conventions of a number of states having at the time of their adopting the Constitution expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers that further declaratory and restrictive clauses should be added and as extending the ground of public confidence in the government will best ensure the beneficent ends of its institution. So it says right there, they added the Bill of Rights to reinforce that the government under the Constitution should have limited powers. Of course, over time, that's been eroded. Uh, various presidents signed into law, uh, really, or, you know, the appearance of law, these really arrogant statements saying that basically they don't have to recognize the rule of law or the Bill of Rights, which are specifically protections for the individual and the state and local governments. That's the whole point of it. So you don't have a centralized tyranny all in one place. It's a balance of power, the overall idea of the geniusness behind the Constitution. So without further ado, let's now read the first 10 amendments of the Bill of Rights. The first amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The second amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The Third Amendment, no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. The Fourth Amendment, totally eroded under the modern day system of tyranny, the right of the people to be secure in their persons' houses papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized tsa have you ever read that fifth amendment 
No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subjected for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor to be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Sixth Amendment, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Seventh Amendment, in suit to common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall otherwise be re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. Eighth Amendment, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Ninth Amendment, the enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. The people retain the other rights. Tenth Amendment, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So in other words, there's a balance of power, and part of that power remains with the individual and the state. How many of these Bill of Rights have they utterly shredded and eroded and defecated upon under all these pretenses of law they have, including chief among them the indefinite detention bill passed today by the Senate in reconciled form, expected to be passed by President Obama uh, perhaps later today or tomorrow. Remember this day, it is a day to live in infamy, December 15, 2011, exactly 220 years after the Bill of Rights was ratified in 1791.